Okay. All right. Recording is on. Good morning and welcome everyone to BC 309, our course on urban church planting. This is our second lecture for this week on uh, 309 urban church planting. Uh, let's take a moment just to pray and we will get started. Can I request somebody to please pray with the class today and we'll start. Okay, let's pray. Yeah. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and beautiful time, Father God. As we are going to learn this topic, Father God, about urban church, we submit ourselves to your mighty hand, Father God, and we ask you the heavenly wisdom and understanding, Father God. Help us to understand, Father God, and all the inputs that pastor is going to speak, Father God, it will be in our heart, Father God, so that it will be helpful when we will do the ministry, Father God, in our future. Father God, we commit pastor and all the students to your mighty hand. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Abhinav. Okay. Good morning once again, everyone. Um, we are talking about the spiritual aspect of uh, church planting or pioneering a work, uh, especially in urban centers. So we talked about the aspect of prayer and exercising spiritual authority. I'm just kind of breaking it down. This is how you pray. This is how we can exercise spiritual authority. Uh, so uh, we just wanted to want us to be clear how to go about doing that and of course, uh, before doing that, we talked about the little preparation that we need to have that is in our hearts and minds. Uh, we are clear about our spiritual authority. We need to know it. We need to be established in it. And then we engage in prayer for people in the region, wherever we are serving, wherever God has called us to pioneer a work. And then we also engage in exercising authority over the powers of darkness. And and the reason that we gave at the very beginning of this section was because the enemy is trying to obstruct the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ from entering into the hearts and minds of people. That's what the enemy can try to do. And uh, he does that primarily in the area of the mind uh, by introducing all kinds of ideas, reasonings, arguments, strongholds, thoughts that interfere, that conflict with the knowledge of God. So while we are you know, uh, bringing the message of the gospel, proclaiming the word of God, the enemy is trying to interfere with that. So Paul refers to it as uh, the blindness that he has put. And so through our prayer and through the exercise of authority, we are dismantling it so that uh, people can then uh, clearly hear the gospel, clearly understand it. And of course, we can't make the choice for them. We're just making it uh, easy for them, or you know, more con you know, more. I mean, make spiritual atmosphere more conducive for them to hear the gospel and then make a decision to believe in the gospel. That's where our prayer and intercession and exercise of spiritual authority comes. And that's the kind of influence it has in the spiritual realm. But like we said towards the end of the last class, in addition to uh, the worship, the prayer, the intercession, the exercise of authority, in addition to all of that, we must proclaim the gospel. Without proclaiming the gospel, you know, uh, people can't hear the gospel, obviously, and they can't make a decision for Jesus Christ. So that brings us to that to our next chapter, which we're going to consider today. Uh, which is the proclamation of the gospel, uh, lesson number 19. Um, I will go through this quickly because you know all of us are familiar with this aspect, which is you know we have to share the gospel, the uncompromised gospel, with the power of God. That means so when Jesus 
commissioned us to go and share the gospel, he said, do it with signs, wonders, and miracles. So that not only is, the is there the proclamation of the gospel, but there's also the demonstration. So people can you know, experience and believe. There will be those who hear, and that may be sufficient for them. They will believe. For some people, they need to hear and plus experience something, experience you know, God healing them or delivering them or working a miracle in their lives, something, a, a demonstration of the power of God. And that would then lead them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so that they hear the gospel, they understand what the gospel is, but they also experience in a very personal way that the gospel is real, that Jesus is real. And so Jesus instructed us and we know in Mark 16, verse 15 to 20, he said, go into, the, all, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. In verse 17 onwards, he said, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Then as he was lifted up into heaven, it says, and uh, they went out, the disciples, they went out and preached everywhere, Mark 16, verse 20. And the Lord worked with them, confirming his word with signs following. So basically he said, you go preach, but also you do all these things, you know, depending, of course, on the situation. They would cast out devils or they would pray for this. They would heal the sick or there would be these supernatural signs. And uh, the Bible says they did it. They went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord was working with them, confirming the word with the signs that followed. And the Holy Spirit has been given, Acts 1 8, to empower us to do that. So that's our goal, you know, however we do it, whether you, you know, whether you do it one on one with a person, whether you do it, you know, in somebody's home, whether you do it out on the street, or whether you do it in, uh, a setting like a gospel meeting or whatever. There's just so many different ways. But the thing is, everywhere the gospel is preached, whenever there's an opportunity, we also demonstrate, pray for people and let people experience uh, the message of the gospel by the power of God. That's what we must do. And so the goal is to, uh, or, or, or as Paul says it in Romans 15, we proclaim the full gospel. So let's turn to Romans 15, and I just want to highlight just, just one verse to, so that we understand you know, this, this whole term or terminology of um, the full gospel. It's Romans 15 and verse 29. Somebody could read that, please. Romans 15, verse 29 for us. Romans 15, 29. Can I read the master? Yep. And I am sure that when I come, Christ will richly bless our time together. Um, Romans 15, 29. Okay. Uh, let me just read I, from uh, New King James. What version is that? Okay. Romans 15, 29, but I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Yeah. So Paul is saying, Romans 15, 29, uh, when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel. Um, so that's where you know, we get the term full gospel. So what is a full gospel? It's, a, it's the gospel that brings the fullness of the blessing of Christ. That means it's the proclamation, the message we proclaim should bring the full blessing. Right? Not part of the blessing, but the full blessing, which includes you know, salvation, uh, it's salvation to the total person. So that's why we say the full gospel, um, the, gospel the proclamation of the gospel that brings the full blessing of Christ to people, the signs, wonders, healings, and miracles. So proclaim the full gospel. Also, uh, the other important thing to keep in mind is to uh, present the gospel in ways that are relevant, addressing 
the needs of the people, uh, the questions that are in the minds of the people, while demonstrating supernatural, while demonstrating supernatural power of God. So we see in, in the ministry of the Apostle Paul that, uh, you know, and we've done this in the apologetics course, that Paul reasoned and demonstrated. You know, in so many places that he went, he presented the gospel in a way that people there would understand. It would address the questions in their minds, as well as as well as demonstrating, praying for them, ministering to them in signs, wonders, and miracles. So he reasoned and demonstrated, and uh, we we should do that today. Let me make the presentation of preaching of the gospel relevant and address the questions that people have, answer the questions, so that they know that uh, you know the gospel does address the real issues and matters of life, and also demonstrate the supernatural power of God. So I don't think we have the option of choosing one versus the other you know so sometimes you know uh, in the christian church people may say okay i i uh, i want to engage in apologetics fine but that doesn't mean you shouldn't demonstrate the power of god you shouldn't expect god's power to be manifested or then you have the other group that says well i want the supernatural power of god to be demonstrated it is good but that doesn't mean you shouldn't also reason with people so what I want to encourage us is that as we are doing our work, especially pioneering work in an urban setting, you know, keep in mind that in an urban setting, people are thinking people. In most cases, they are people who are trying to think through, you know, various questions. They're trying to think through questions of life. They're trying to think through various struggles they're facing with. So they, are, they have questions and they are sincere, sincerely asking these questions. So uh, we should be willing to respond to their questions meaningfully at the same time uh, demonstrate God's power. So uh, we take the example of the Apostle Paul and in what we do, let's address Paul. And then we also uh, break controlling powers. Through you now we, we do it by establishing God's presence in that community. Now, when we say establish God's presence, that means the church or the work that we are pioneering becomes a place where God is welcome. God is being, you know, quote unquote, hosted, or God is having a dwelling place among that people through what we do, be the people of God too, right? Because Let's say in most cases, before we have come and started the work uh, to establish the gospel, uh, uh, the enemy has been there for, uh, and it has already affected the minds of people and doing all kinds of things. Um, and so we are coming in there, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ and saying, you know, we're going to extend God's kingdom in the hearts and lives of people in this, among this community. So how are we going to do it? We're going to do it through praise and worship, through prayer, through our deeds of righteousness. So yesterday, towards the end, we mentioned, you know, that we do the opposite of what we see prevalent among the people. If there is hate, we demonstrate love. If there is, um, uh, you know, unrighteousness, we demonstrate righteousness. If there is uncleanness, we demonstrate holiness. If Whatever, you know, the, the evil, we overcome evil with good by doing the opposite, by living the opposite, by demonstrating the opposite. Because uh, the good always triumphs over evil, over, uh, we overcome evil with good. But then we need a people who would do that, who would demonstrate that. And then we also proclaim and demonstrate the gospel of Jesus Christ. And even basically establishing communities of people, that is groups of people, who would keep on doing this. We are there in that city. We're going to establish God's presence. This is what we're going to do. And through the life we live in the midst of the people, we are breaking the influence of controlling powers. Right? And we are just telling devil, you know, you may have been here all this while, but here's a group of people who are saying no to that. 
who have authority over that influence, and you cannot have any influence over us. And we are going to increase the influence of God's kingdom in this place. So in the Bible, and I think, uh, you know, I, I referenced these yesterday, uh, in Acts 8, when Philip goes to Samaria, the people are set free from the influence of Simon the Sorcerer. Uh, when Paul and Barnabas, they go to uh, the island of Paphos, there in Acts 13, uh, the ruler of that, the governor of that island, he is set free from the control of a man practicing sorcery. Or in Philippi, people are under the control of a spirit of Python that was actually working through a fortune-telling girl, but if they're all set free. Or uh, in Acts 19, we see in Ephesians, the goddess Diana, who controlled them, is dethroned as Paul and his team minister there. So we are seeing that the advancement of God's kingdom in all of these cities is destabilizing, is breaking whatever was prevalent among them from the powers of darkness. When the kingdom of come, kingdom of God comes in, that power is pushed out. People are set free, and so we, you know, uh, uh, we 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 establish this, or we see this happen as we establish God as people. So. The proclamation of the gospel, the full gospel, uh, in a way that is relevant to the people, addressing their questions, and establishing the community of people amongst them, uh, must. it's an ongoing thing. Right? It's, it's not something that happens immediately. It's going to take time. But as we do that, step by step, we are advancing. Step by step, uh, demonic influence is being weakened. Step by step, it's, we are advancing. Therefore, it's going to become easier as time progresses for people to come to faith in Christ. And we just have to stay on this journey. In, in relation to that, uh, part of the spiritual work that we have to do is as we are pioneering the work, remember, we need more people engaged in reaching that urban center. and it's the saints, it's the believers who are going to be able to go out and be salt and light, who are going to be able to go out and influence um, the community, the city, the region. So saints must be equipped to do this work. Right? So that's part of what we uh, must do. We, we, we've talked about it in the previous section, just re-emphasizing it here. So from a spiritual aspect, teach the word of God. That's what's going to feed God's people. That's what's going to equip them, fill them with truth, wisdom, and understanding. And that's how the church is going to uphold truth in the society. Uh, emphasize the supernatural because it's through the demonstration of the power of God, the church, the people of God are going to be able to influence, uh, equip the people to be salt and light. That is, Keep teaching them, saying this is how you can bring kingdom influence to whichever part of whichever sphere of society you're involved in. Right? So we're equipping the people so they can be an influence wherever they are positioned. So uh, th this is very purposeful equipping. Uh, also equip them for lifestyle evangelism. That means uh, you know they should be ready to share Jesus anytime, anywhere. Right? Uh, so encourage them. Uh, give them tools, give them training, uh, give them opportunities for evangelism, and equip, empower, and send out the people of God. So this is part of our spiritual work that happens. That people are encouraged to go out, do whatever they can uh, in that, wherever they are. So basically, God's people are taking the message up, uh, to their spheres of influence. Now we need to extend it a little further, and this is something for us to think about, which is uh, to engage as the citywide church. This is lesson number 21. So in any urban center in today's world, it is very likely that there are already other churches and other ministries who are at work. 
uh, it's very rare that uh, there would be a place or a region, at least an urban center, where um, there isn't already some Christian presence. Most likely, you know, there's a church or there's some ministry going on. So as we go and pioneer, now of course we need lots and lots of churches and lots and lots of ministries because cities are so big, cities have so many people. So one more new church starting or one more new ministry starting is just all, all welcome because there are so many people to be reached. But we need to learn how to work together. And so for that, we need to build trust and strengthen amongst ourselves with other churches and ministries. So we are not a threat, but we must work together. And I, and I like this, you know, what Francis Franzipan said, he was a minister of God. I, I think he's still alive, I'm not very sure, but um, he, he, he was a wonderful minister back in the 80s, 90s, and so on. Um, he, he said, it takes a citywide church to win a citywide war. Uh, it takes a citywide church to win a citywide war. That means one ministry, one church on their own cannot do this entire work. Uh, the citywide church, all believers in the city, if we can work together in some way, some fashion, and you know, we can then win the citywide war because the cities are so big these days. Um, so that's why we must think in terms of the citywide church and see what we can do uh, to build trust and strengthen relationships with other churches and ministries in the city. And then to be able to serve together. You know, one is we serve other churches and ministries so that we can strengthen them. And then we find ways to work with them. You know. So both uh, thoughts to keep in mind. How can we bless others who are already working in the city? And how can we work together with others who are already working in the city? That's very important. And which means we must have a kingdom mindset. That means we are saying, look, what we do together for God's kingdom is more important than our own individual churches and ministries becoming big or famous or whatever. Right? The kingdom of God supersedes our individual ministries and churches. And so if you have a kingdom mindset, then we could, we could do this. We could bless other churches as well as work with other churches and ministries. And that's how the citywide church can begin to engage. Now, some of you, you know, you may have, you would have, or I should say would have, we have covered all of this in the book on Kingdom Builders, which we did in the second year. Uh, and also there's another book called Divine Order in the Citywide Church. I encourage you to read that. But the main point here is this, that while we are learning to pioneer a church or pioneer a ministry, remember we are not the only ones doing the work. There are other churches, other ministries. And so if we can think in terms of working together, whatever extent possible, and think in terms of a citywide church engaging in a citywide war against the powers of darkness, we're going to be more effective in seeing transformation. Okay. Um, let me pause here and take, see if there are any questions before we step into the last um, section. Any questions here? Any thoughts here? So what we've done is we've gone to the spiritual side of things. How do we spiritually engage? We talked about the natural aspects when you're pioneering a church or a ministry, the spiritual aspects which we have just covered. Any thoughts, any questions? Okay. Kim Below is um, asking a question. Pastor, can you give an example of city-wide war? Okay. So, when you talk about a city-wide church engaging in a city-wide war, we are, of course, referring to spiritual things. Okay? We are not uh, referring to city-wide war as in 
a physical, natural wall. We are talking about spiritually engaging over the city. Um, so this means that the larger body of Christ is coming together to engage spiritually for the city. What has happened, at least, uh, let me just speak from this perspective of Bangalore City. Uh, okay, so the, the fact is, the fact is that in most cities, the body of Christ is quite divided. Um, there are many churches, but you know they all belong to so many different denominations. So there are those wall, denominational walls that divide us. There are many ministries, but many ministries are all, we're all focused on our own activities. We don't have time for each other. And so it's a it's a challenge, you know, uh, to think in terms of a citywide church and a citywide war. That means, hey, we are all fighting the same enemy. So can we do it together, as opposed to doing it in our own silos or in our own independent areas of work and ministry. So one of the ways that the citywide church can engage in a citywide war is, example, come together for praise, worship, and prayer. So that's one way. So we, we have tried that in the past in our city. Um, so there were a couple of years, I think we did that for two, three years, where we had, we called it in those days, a Unity Sunday. And on that Sunday, we tried to get as many churches as possible. The invitation went to, you know, basically all churches in the city. But we tried to get as many people, believers, together in one place so that we could pray and worship together. So that was through our prayer, uh, through our worship. We tried to have a common worship service um, to engage in a citywide war. The biblical, biblical principle, uh, you find that in John 21 and verse 22, Jesus said, you know, Jesus in his, in his, in his prayer, and sometimes this is referred to as his high priestly prayer in John 21, or yeah, in John 21, sorry, in John 20, my mistake, John 17, what's happening? John 17, 21, okay? John 17, 21, Jesus prays. Let me type this out for us. John 17, 21, okay? So Jesus praying, John 17, 21, that they all may be one, as you, Father, in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. So this is a very powerful verse because Jesus is saying, he's praying, he's praying for us. And he's praying that we may be one. And the result is that the world may believe. So us coming together as one is going to be a vehicle, a means by which the world will believe in Jesus. So this sense of this unity of God's people in a place is so important. So we were trying to practice this. So we would, you know, we designated a Sunday as a unity Sunday. We just invited people to come together, let's have a worship service together. And of course, you know, we had to do it in multiple languages uh, because of you know, so many regional languages happening. So we tried that and we, we, we did it, I think, for two or three years and then that died out. Uh, so that would be an example where we attempted to engage in a citywide war spiritually through worship, uh, prayer, and so different pastors will lead different segments of prayer, we had prayer and so on. Now, uh, there are challenges uh, in doing something like that. It's just that, you know, um, you know pastors feel insecure. They feel like, okay, maybe I will lose people from my church. They'll go to another church. All, all these all these things, all of the, the things, the practical side of it. That's one thing. 
The other thing that we were not able to do, but it was on our plan, was could we pool in resources to address certain social needs or needs in the city? You know, uh, example, if there are, you know, could we do something about the kids who are made to beg on the streets in the city, street kids? Could we, like that, address certain problems in the city, but by pooling resources? And that was so difficult, you know, to to get churches to come together and say, look, we can do this. So we never even reached that point. We we said, okay, let's start with this. Let us come together in worship and prayer, but hopefully we can journey together into doing things together, engaging in a citywide walk. So that will be another form of a citywide walk. Now, can that happen? Yes, it can, but it is very challenging. But John 17, 21 is the promise. And uh, I would encourage you, and you know, we are looking, I mean, I'm just thinking it's, it's in the back of our minds here as well in our city, now that you know the whole pandemic thing is over and uh, we are able to all meet together, uh, is to bring that back in some form. Uh, one of the things we were doing prior to the pandemic is holding a monthly breakfast meeting. Uh, we started that in 2013, and it was going on every month till uh, till we had to stop in, I think, in Feb 2020 was the last time we met, um, just before everything closed. Uh, but we would host a breakfast meeting, and we just sent an invitation to as many pastors in the city. Uh, now, just to come together for fellowship, just to build trust, just to get to know each other, because... If that doesn't happen, then we cannot bring our congregations together for a common place of prayer and worship. That won't happen. So this was more like a precursor to the bigger thing. And it was going fine. Uh, there was trust, understanding being built. Uh, it takes time. You know, we have to meet once, once a month, shake hands, talk, uh, discuss things, pray together. So if we as pastors can do it, that slowly we will trust each other enough to be able to get congregations to come together and pray. So, you know, now we have to think of resuming that. But that would be an example where the church is engaging in a city-wide war. Now, I know that in other cities, they have done much better than what we have done here in our city. Uh, there are examples that we can see globally where um, there's been um, a greater sense of unity and so on. But I would encourage all of us to think along those lines, see what can be done. Hope that answers your question, Kondilu. Any other questions? Okay, uh, no more questions. We're going to go to the next section. Everyone's okay? Fine, we, uh, I, uh, class is very quiet today. So we're going to move forward to our next section. Let's go. So we step into now the last uh, section in this course, which is the personal life of a church planter, or you know, you could say the church personal life of a pioneer. Somebody wants to start um, a church or a Christian ministry. So remember, a, a lot of the things that we have said, while it does ap apply to starting a local church, you can also use it, you know, in terms of starting any kind of Christian ministry in an urban context. So now, you know, we, we intentionally covered the practical aspects and spiritual aspects, which are more general. And we kept this section to the end because this is something you need to think about at a personal level, right? That is, these are things you need to be thinking about and praying about before and prepare yourself for, before you start out 
to pioneer something, whether it's a local church or a Christian ministry. Right? So the first thing is to recognize your call to pioneer. And that means to know that you've been called to do this. See, some people are graced by God to pioneer. And to pioneer, it, it re requires a certain different kind of grace. Some of us can step into an existing work and you know make that better. Some of us can step into a work and just serve faithfully under leadership. And then there are those of us who are called by God to go and start a work somewhere, like start from nothing. You know, just dig the ground and start from scratch. But that requires a certain amount of grace. And so I want us to, you know, understand that. Um, what would be some indicators of grace that uh, you've been called the pioneer? One, you know, here are some things, and all of these things are important, and you may find one or more relevant to your situation. One is uh, a pioneering spirit. That means you are, you know, you are willing to try. You're somebody who is adventurous, right? You're willing to step out, try something new, to pave the way. Uh, it's okay if nobody else has attempted it, or it's okay if you have to go do it alone. In a sense, you are adventurous, right? So that's what we're talking about, a pioneering spirit. It means you're willing to step up. Now, not everybody has that. You know, most people are like, okay, I, I prefer, you know, in, in business, you call them as entrepreneurs. They're, they're, they're entrepreneurial. They, they like to go and start something. They like to, you know, do that. There's just an excitement. But if somebody says, well, that's not for me. I'd love to work in something that's already established. Okay? And we need both kinds of people. It's not like one is better than the other. We need both kinds of people. So uh, if you feel that you, know, you have a pioneering spirit, you are adventurous, then yeah, maybe then that's, that's, that's a good pointer or indicator that maybe God may be calling you to do something. Important second thing is you should be able to work independently. And especially when you're getting started, nobody's gonna come and tell you, hey, wake up, today it's eight o'clock, get up, you've got to go to work, uh, you know, you've got to do this. No, you've got to have the ability to get up on your own, uh, lead yourself, initiate things, uh, without anybody coming and telling you what to do. Right? So the ability to work independently, uh, to be your own, you know, in a nice way, to be your own boss, to lead yourself, to motivate yourself, that's, that's an important thing. Thirdly, uh, you should be able to build bridges. That means uh, you should be comfortable working with people from different backgrounds and cultures because in most urban centers today you will find people of all you know just diverse backgrounds and cultures and so for you it should, you should feel comfortable that hey i can you know i can yeah they're from a different background different culture it's okay i can sit and talk to them i can have a conversation i can connect with them you know so that the ability to build bridges with different people is, is especially important if you're working in an urban setting. Now, there may be exceptions to this. I understand that uh, uh, you, know, you may find places where it's very homogeneous and uh, you know, it's just one kind of people. I'm not saying that that's never there, but in most cases, uh, you will be required to work with people from different backgrounds and cultures especially in an urban context. And if you have that, if, if you're very comfortable doing that, you know, that's a great, great indicator that, yeah, you could be a pioneer. You could be somebody who goes and starts something. Another important thing is being a visionary. I mean, it's, you know, it's just the ability to see something when nothing exists. Right? So you can, you can go into a city, of course, lots of things happening, but then you begin to see opportunities. 
others you know others are seeing yeah just everything is normal but you are looking at hey there's an opportunity to do something there hey there's an opportunity to do something there oh, look there's another way to reach people you know you're just being a visionary you're just looking at opportunities everywhere and so it's like if you stand next to an empty plot some people will see an empty plot but a visionary sees a big building he sees you know whatever you know maybe a apartment complex maybe a home maybe a uh, office space something he's envisioning you're not just seeing an empty space empty plot of land he's seeing something else so that's a visionary and the ability to see something and nothing exists right? that's a that's a good indicator that uh, god can use you as a pioneer also if you have prior history with god in doing church plants you worked in those kinds of settings and god used you that way that's a good indicator that he's probably going to use you again sometimes it comes as a stirring in your heart you feel like man i need to go and i need to start something i need to address this problem but in order to address this problem i need to start something so that could also be an indicator something that's really moving you inside right now of course god can give you a clear and confirmed word uh, however it comes it could come something that god puts in your heart it could come through a prophetic word it comes through a dream or a vision uh, but god has given you a word and uh, then sometimes it just you know I, i put this in quote the accidental church plant that means god just sets up a situation where hey you find yourself in a situation where you know you've got a baby in your hand so to speak like okay i've got to do this because i i i didn't think this would happen but look it's right there you know god's put it in your lap so to speak and i think i shared about you know how um, the nepali church started here so uh these are just some things i could think about and so i put it down here that would be indicators that god is setting you up god is getting ready, you ready to be a pioneer for you to go out and start something uh and so you could keep an eye on these things let me pause here uh, any questions on this on uh, signs or indicators that maybe god has graced you to step out pioneer and and this is not a complete list these are just things i could think of there could be other indicators where god is saying look i want you to go and start something i want you to go pioneer a church or pioneer a christian ministry uh, but these are things i felt i could share any questions on that runs okay All right. Um I think let's just do one more section before we um close out. I know we have a few more minutes. Okay, there's a question from Charles. Uh shed more light on accident. So, for example, you know, there could be so many different scenarios, but the point I was trying to emphasize there is maybe you you know somebody wasn't even thinking about starting something they weren't even planning it wasn't something they were considering they were just going about life as usual and then god just set up something for them you know and uh, they found themselves in a situation where they had to pioneer they had to do something so for example and these are just hypothetical situations and you know so example let's say uh there's a group of people they go you know they they go on a mission trip um they say okay we're going to go do surf you know a community for two weeks and come back so this group goes uh they're going to serve them serve a community for two weeks maybe you know provide them food or provide them certain things they go there for two weeks they're serving and as they're serving in that community maybe five or 10 people get saved and then and these five ten or 10 people say hey 
uh, we don't have a church to go to. Would one of you be willing to come and, you know, nurture us in the faith? Now, in that group, let's say in that group of five people who went to serve this community, none of them were thinking about pioneering. None of them were thinking about, you know, going and being a church planter. But they just wanted to go and help this community for two weeks and come back. But in the process, people got saved and they're requesting saying, can one of you nurture us in the faith? And so there's a group of five people, they say, hey, you know, anybody feel called to take this up? So they pray and maybe somebody in the group says, hey, I'm willing to do it. I just feel I should do it. It's very, it's very strong in my heart. I need to do it. And so that person prays. And then, you know, that person says, okay, I'm going to step into it. <laughs> Sorry. So this is just a scenario where, you know, none of the five people in that group were thinking of planting a church or being pioneers, but it, things were just orchestrated where this was presented and God stirred the heart of one of them to say, you do it. So the other four would return wherever they came from. This fifth person, this fifth person steps in and takes up the responsibility of pioneering a local church for that people. He he starts off with these five people who have given their life to Christ and uh, their lives to Christ, and then from there, you know, a local church starts. So that's just one example. Again, there's just there's so many different ways God could work, and um, and uh, you know, basically set things up. For somebody to accidentally pioneer a church, but you know it's not an accident for God, of course. I hope that helps, Charles. Abraham. Um, Abraham's question: What are indicators? Because the ministry in Vietnam just started like that. I was getting bigger than we thought. Uh, are there signs to prove that it is from God? Yeah, so Abraham, you see the scripture says, unless the Lord builds the house, this is Psalm 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. So it says, unless God is building it, our works, are, our efforts are in vain. But you can also look at it in a different way. When God starts building the house, then it becomes necessary for laborers to start laboring with God. Right? So from what you're describing, Abraham, it seems like God has started the building the house. I mean, uh, you're saying it just started and now it's getting bigger. So God is building. So what must the laborers do? They need to get in and become builders. It's okay, hey, God is moving. Let's get on. Let's jump in. Let's position ourselves. Let's do the work. Right? So without God, we can't build. But when God is building, we better get in there and work with them we, because we are co-workers with God. Just step in. Whatever opportunities are there, just get in there and build because God is building. He needs us there in the place to be co-workers. So I would uh, just uh, uh, Psalm 127 verse 1, verse Corinthians 3, I think it's verse 5. So I would just, I would just you know, point you to, the, to these scriptures for you to think about and say that, hey, God is building something. We are co-workers with God, so we can't be uh, absconding uh, when God is uh, doing work, right? Mm, yeah, surface contents three nine. So think about this. Okay. All right, our time is up. Any other questions? Oh, so we have a request. Louis is getting married on Thursday. And I'll ask for prayers for everyone at the house. Wonderful. Congratulations, Louis. What's your fiance's name? Mm 
Cindy. All right. So we're going to pray for Louis and Cindy. Uh, their wedding is going to happen on Thursday. And in case you're live streaming your wedding, please share the link with all the class so they can connect and watch your wedding online in case you're live streaming it. Or if you have a YouTube video or something, it'll, it'll be wonderful to see what um, the wedding looks like. Anyway, let's take a moment okay. to pray. Wonderful. All right. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Let's take a moment to pray for Louis and Cindy uh, before we close. Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, time together. We could share, we could learn. We pray the Holy Spirit continue to speak to every student and each of us, Lord, are leading us in your path. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you lead us. Father, together today, we join our hearts to pray for Louis and Cindy. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we speak blessing over them as they're united in marriage this week. Lord, thank you that you stand as a witness to this holy union that they enter into, Father. We pray the wisdom of God, the understanding of God upon them, that through wisdom, through your understanding, they will build a wonderful marriage, a wonderful home, and together may they be a blessing uh, for the kingdom of God. Together may they extend uh, the kingdom of God. Together may they serve the purposes of God. And Father, we speak complete provision over their lives, that all their needs are met and they have abundance. They are more than enough because you are there El Shaddai. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. God bless you. Bye now. Thank you, guys. See you soon. Bye now.